And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Welcome to 3ABN Australia Homecoming. Hello and welcome to 3ABN Australia Homecoming 2018. Wow, Ryan, that's kind of a mouthful. But we are so glad that you're joining us, maybe through TV, radio, or the internet. What a blessing we've already received here. I'm calling it camp meeting, homecoming, however you want to describe it. But I, audience here, have you been blessed already? I don't know if you heard that, but there was a hearty amen. And I know for Jill and myself what a joy it's been to be here in Australia. We've never been here before, but wow, what an incredible experience. What a blessing to me, each one of you. That's right. Earlier, before we started this program, talked to several of you. Some have driven, Ryan, over 18 hours to come to this event. Isn't that amazing? That, That's that a lot amazing. of dedication. Yeah, we, we were just saying that we flew over the... Pacific Ocean, 15 hours, and I can imagine having to drive 18 hours, I guess, across uh, Australia. So that is, that's powerful and that's dedication. Mm, and uh, really yeah, is. we hope you brought uh, your Bibles at home and here because we're going to be having a powerful Bible study as we continue on with our Knowing God Homecoming. That's the theme, Knowing God. That's right. You know, Brother Ryan, you've just joined 3 been over the past few months, right. and you've already He's a part of the family. It's like you've never even, it's like you've been here forever. That's right. But unfortunately, your wife is not able to make this trip because she is a teacher. So she's teaching the young people back home in the USA, but I know you'd love for her to be here. Yes. But Ryan and his wife, Stephanie, what a blessing they are to 3ABN. Yes, it's such a blessing to be a part of the team. And uh, I want just to give a shout out to my lovely That's wife, right. Stephanie. She is actually just finished school. Uh, about 30 minutes ago, they got out of school. She's a principal at the uh, Thompsonville Christian Academy there uh, in, in the U.S. Mm, yeah. Amen. And I have to say, our message today, I'm really excited about this because I know her. She is Jill. She's my wife. <laughs> We've been married for a wonderful 16 years. We amen. just passed our 16th wedding anniversary. She is a woman of the Word of God. Amen. She loves to study the Word of God, but she's also, she loves people. And how you see her and how you've seen her on 3ABN is how she is at home. I'm so blessed God has brought us together and what a privilege it is to minister at 3ABN together to be a part of saving souls for eternity. And 3ABN is not just the people you see in front of the camera. That's right. It's all of you. It's all of you at home Absolutely. that make up what 3ABN is all about. So today, Joe's going to be bringing the message to us, and it's entitled, of course, our theme is Knowing God, but then it's Through the Trials of Life. But before that, Absolutely. we have Actually, music. Actually, in, in the meantime... Ooh, that's a pretty good segue. <laughs> in the meantime, we have a wonderful special number uh, that's going to be brought to us by Tim Parton, and the title of the song is In the Meantime. So after Tim, you will see Joe. Thank you. If you know the story of Job... These words will um, ring, with, ring to you. <laughs> I am broken in a room alone where the only light is you. And I am beaten by the days of tribulation I've gone through. My life has been laid bare right before your eyes. Today my heart despairs and tomorrow I may die. But in the meantime you're the lifter of my head and in the lean times, you're the giver of my bread. Lord, your goodness is too wonderful for me. I believe my Redeemer is alive, even in the meantime. I have nothing you have given and you've taken it away. Oh, but Lord, I thank you for all I really need is you 
and you have stayed. You formed me from the dust. Your spirit gave me breath. I am yours in life, and I am yours in death. And in the meantime, you're the lifter of my head. And in the lean times, you're the giver of my bread. Lord, your goodness is too wonderful for me. I believe my Redeemer is alive, even in the meantime. far too wonderful for me. And I believe my Redeemer is alive. Oh, I believe my Redeemer is alive. Even in your meantime, Tim, what a blessing. In the meantime, God is on the throne. In the meantime, we can trust him with our lives. What a tremendous privilege to be here down under in 3ABN Australia in the Avondale Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church for the homecoming. Greg and I have been looking forward to this time to come and to share with each one of you. And you all are a wonderful group of people. We've had the privilege to meet a few, and we're looking forward to meeting the rest of you. God has people everywhere. Praise the Lord for that. Our theme this camp meeting, homecoming, is knowing God. The theme scripture, John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. How do we know him? We know him by his word. We know him through his son, Jesus Christ. We know him by his character and through his law. We know him through prayer, through life's experiences. And today I'm talking about knowing God through the trials of life, through the joy and pain, through the grief and loss, through the acceptance of what has been and the surrender of what might never be, through anything and everything, knowing that He is good, that He is love, and that He can be trusted. Let's pray. Holy Father, just now, I ask that You would hide me behind the cross, that you would get me out of the way, that Jesus could be seen, that your word would go forth, and we would be hearers and doers of your word, that we could see the love of God in a way that maybe we have never seen before. And we thank you in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. It was a Sabbath afternoon. Greg and I had just come out of church and greeting people. You know how you do after church. It was a, um, we were out west in North America. And a lady came up to me that I'd never seen before. And she said, Jill, I want to talk to you for a minute. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, let's talk. She said, I read an article in the Adventist Review that you wrote about your journey with infertility. And instantly I thought, okay, what's coming next? Because when you open yourself up to be vulnerable and to share some of the issues that you have gone through, some people encourage and pray, and some people have many suggestions 
or we could say some constructive criticism. Have you ever experienced that? So I didn't know which direction she's coming from. Is this okay, this is an issue, Jill, or is she coming for, to encourage? So I said, okay. And she said, I want to thank you for being honest. You have helped me a great deal. Can I tell you a story? And I said, sure. And so we kind of stepped to the side because there's all these people after church mingling. And she said, my husband and I couldn't have kids. And we desperately wanted to have kids and we couldn't. And we didn't know what to do. And we prayed and God put on our heart that we ought to adopt. And I said, that's wonderful. Adoption's a great thing. She said, you haven't heard the whole story, Jill. So we decided to adopt, and we were going to do a foreign adoption. Now, in the States, if you do a foreign adoption, it can be expensive. You can spend $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 to adopt kids from a foreign country. She and her husband spent thousands. They received the news that it was going to be, they were going to get two little girls. There were four and five. We'll call the girls Sarah and Mary. And they already named the girls. They were so excited. They were going to come home to them, and they were going to be a mom and dad, and they had paid all this money for the adoption. Then she said, we waited, and the girls didn't come. And we waited, and they didn't come. And then we got the news that the girls had been sold. They lost the money. The girls were not just sold to someone else to be adopted. Neither were they sold to be workers. They were sold in the sex trade. So the very kids that were to be theirs, that they had paid money for, that they could adopt, they were so excited to be mom and dad. Now they had to live with the knowledge that those precious little girls were possibly dead or worse. It had been several years since that time. And she said, Jill, I don't even know how to deal with the pain. I can't get over this. And I thought, what I've been through is nothing compared to that. I can't even imagine going through pain like that. How do you find the face of Christ when you're going through pain? How do you find him when you can't even feel his presence? when you don't even know where to look for him. I want to talk today, knowing God through trials, a little different angle. We're going to talk about answers to prayer. When I was growing up, I was always taught there were three answers to prayer. One is, can you tell me? Yes. Then there's one over here, which is? No. And what's the one in the middle? Wait, right? Okay. I'm going to submit to you that there's four answers to prayer. Over here, number one is no, not yet. That would be the wait, right? That would be the maybe. It's the same one. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that. How do we know God in the waiting time? What are we supposed to do while we wait? This is no, not yet. Then we have this one, which is no, I love you too much. How can love be a no? We're going to spend most of our time on that. No, I love you too much. How can love be a no? Then there is yes, I thought you'd never ask. And then there is yes and so much more. Let's start with no. The first one was no what? Not yet. No, not yet. Yeah, let's start with that. How do we know God during the waiting time? If you're like me, I do not like to wait. It drives me nuts when I have to sit and wait. That bothers me. They say that on average, people wait 15 minutes at a restaurant for a table, 20 minutes a day for the bus or the train, 32 minutes at the doctor's office. Now you know why you don't like to go to the doctor's office. If you're waiting for a lifetime, if you spend your whole lifetime, if you average out a person's lifespan, people spend six months of their life in line waiting for something. People spend 43 days on hold with that automated phone system that you hate so much. People spend 27 days of their life waiting at the bus platform. 
And get this, an average nine years of your life on your cell phone. Something's wrong with that. The difficulty of waiting. Now, the, the waiting I just talked about, waiting at the restaurant or waiting for the bus, that's the type of waiting that maybe makes us just a bit impatient. But what about when the waiting is something different? When you're waiting for the result of the biopsy. You're waiting for the door to open, for the job you always wanted. Or the home you dreamed of. Or even to have a home at all. What if you're waiting for finances for school? What if you're waiting your whole life for a spouse? Or for kids? Or for a friend? What do you do then? Why do we wait? We wait because we have no choice. If we had a choice, we wouldn't be waiting. We wait because we have no answer. We wait because we have no way out. We are unable to fix it, remedy it, or make it better. We are incapable of changing our circumstances. How do we wait? What do we do in the midst of that process? I think there's three ways that we wait. When God says, no, not yet, there's three ways that we wait in the midst of that process. First, we wait in surrender and submission to his will. Psalm 40, verse 8, Jesus says, I delight, do you know how it finishes? To do your will. Oh, my God, your law is within my heart. Now, that word delight in Hebrew means desire. So what is he saying? I desire to do your will. Have you ever really desired to do something? Desired to do someone else's will. How do we even know what the will of God is? I desire to do your will. In order to know his will, we have to know him. And this is life eternal, that they should know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We have to have personal, first-hand experience in order to know him. And to know him is to love him. To know him is to desire him. Often, you know, in my waiting time, when God says, no, not yet, you know how I wait? I wait in frustration. I wait in self-pity. I wait in fear. And yet God says, don't do any of those things. Wait in surrender and submission to his will. I'm not very good with either one of those. Surrender and submission, giving up my way, choosing to accept the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of my favorite poems I have written um, typed up, and it's in a frame right beside our bed. And it says, In acceptance lies peace. O my heart be still. Let thy restless worries cease and accept his will. Though this test or though this trial is not my choice, it is his. Therefore rejoice. In his plan there cannot be anything to make me sad. If this is his choice for me, I want to take it and be glad. Make from it some lovely thing to the glory of my King. Cease from sighs and murmuring. Sing His loving grace. This trial means my furthering to a wealthy place. From my fear, He will give release. In acceptance lies peace. So how do we wait? We wait in surrender and submission to His will. Number two, we wait in active service not in idleness or discouragement. Remember the parable of the ten talents, and the king sent, remember he went on a far journey, the nobleman, and he gave to a certain man so many talents and others. Luke 19.30, he said, Occupy until I come. In other words, practically speaking, we don't sit at home and mope in self-pity. We don't sit in fear. We occupy until he comes. We actively choose to engage in service, seeking out other people, serving with joy. 
First, we wait in surrender and submission to his will. Second, we wait in active service, not in idleness or discouragement. And third, we wait in eager expectation of what God is going to accomplish in our lives. Turn with me to Romans. Pastor John said last night, Romans is one of, I think he said it's his favorite book, and it is one of my favorite books as well. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're going to read verses 3 through 5. Romans 5, verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Now, I want to stop right there. The word tribulation in Greek means internal pressure. There's actually two different words for pressure or struggle or tribulation. One means internal. There's another one that means external. This one is flipsis, which means internal struggle. So it says, we glory in tribulations. So that doesn't mean we're glorying in external physical issues. The tribulation that Paul's talking about here is the mental struggle. Would you agree that's the worst kind? Any type of trial that we go through, it's the battle of the mind that is the biggest challenge. At least for me it is. It's the battle to whether I'm going to wallow in self-pity or not. It's the battle whether I'm going to get depressed or I'm going to be afraid or I'm going to lash out in anger. All of that's the battle of the mind. So we glory in tribulations. This is that internal struggle or internal pressure. Knowing that tribulation produces what? perseverance or patience, depends on your version. Tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character. That is a character that is forged under trial. And character produces hope, meaning in Greek, eager expectation. Now, hope does not disappoint or hope is not an illusion. King James says, hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the first category, when God says, no, not yet, and when we are in the midst of the waiting time, we wait in surrender and submission to His will. We wait in active service, not in idleness or discouragement. And we wait in eager expectation of what God's going to accomplish. Now, I told you I wanted to spend the balance of our time with this one right here. When God says, no, I love you too much. How can love be a no? Now, I do not begin to understand this, and I want to be clear about that. This is a deep topic we could spend days on, and we can't even truly understand the mind of God. But in my study, I found three times, three reasons, and now there's more, granted. I'm just saying three we're talking about today. Three reasons why love is a no. I'll give you three illustrations to show them, and then we'll unpack each one of them. How many of you are parents? So, three quarters, at least, 75. So, if you're a parent, and your child, say you're boiling something on your stove, and the child reaches up to touch the hot burner, what do you say? No. no. What if your child runs out into the street, and there's a car coming, what do you say? No. Now, you don't just say, okay, I guess, don't do that, honey. No, right? You'd be pretty firm about it. No, get out of the street. Get your hand off the stove. Why? Because love is protection. Sometimes when God says, no, I love you too much, he said no because he wants to protect you and I from stepping outside of the boundaries of his will. Love is protection. We'll unpack that in a minute. Illustration number two. If you're married, a husband or wife, if the other one steps outside of the marriage into adultery, the spouse, say the husband steps out, and the spouse is the one who says the husband just stepped out into an adul adulterous relationship. The wife says, no. Why? Because love is ownership. When you get married 
and you say, I do, what does that mean? You belong, as it were, to the other person. Love is ownership. God is saying, we are his children. We belong to him. And anything that comes in between our relationship and him, he gets jealous over. And he says, I don't want that. Love is ownership. We will unpack that more in a moment. Number three, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember him prostrate on the ground? God, please. I don't want to go to the cross. I can't do it. My humanity won't let me. Please, if it's possible, God, I don't want to go. And God said no. Why? Because love is sacrifice for someone else's salvation. First, love is protection. Love is ownership. And love is sacrifice for someone else's salvation. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, there would be no hope of salvation for you and for I. So let's unpack those three. Love is protection. Why does God say, no, I love you too much? Because he wants to protect you and I. His law and his boundaries are really for our protection. The Garden of Eden, remember when God created Adam and Eve, and he said, don't, what did he say? Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, why did he do that? It was for their protection. If they stepped outside the boundaries of his will, and if they went and took of the fruit and ate, there would be sin. There would be pain. There would be separation from God. There would ultimately be death. He wasn't being harsh. He wasn't being cruel. It was for their protection. The same thing with the Ten Commandments, the law of God. God is not giving arbitrary rules. He's not saying, okay, don't go out, Jill, and kill someone because I want to be mean about it. What is he saying? I love you. And I can enable you so you don't even have hatred in your heart toward your brother. These are for your protection. What about the second one? Love is ownership. Now, remember the example with the husband and wife stepping outside? Now, if I were to ask you, is jealousy a good thing or a bad thing? How many would say jealousy is a good thing? Okay, I saw a little bit. Now, how many would say jealousy is bad? We could all agree jealousy is bad, right? And we know that. But could there be a time when there's a godly form of jealousy? Godly jealousy is God is jealous for us. Why? Because he owns us. You and I, humanly, from an ungodly perspective, are jealous of other people or jealous of other things. Why? We don't have any rightful ownership over them, right? And we're coveting or wanting something that doesn't even belong to us. Godly, jealous. Jealous for us is a divine trait. Jealous of us is an ungodly or evil trait. Why is God jealous for us? Because he owns us. He made us in the beginning, and then he bought us back with the blood of Jesus. Turn with me to Isaiah 43. This is one of my other favorite books. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who, what's that word? Created you. In Hebrew, it literally means to form or shape. Thus says the Lord who formed you. He created us. He made us in the beginning in the image of God. Thus says the Lord who formed you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. So he made us in the beginning. We rightfully belong to him because he made us in the beginning. Then he bought us back. We chose to walk away. We chose to turn our back. I chose to spit in his face. And yet, Jesus 
while I was yet a sinner, while I was still wallowing in the mud, while I still had, I was fighting him like a little kid, you know, hitting on the parent. I was kicking against him. He died for me. He bought me back. And he said, Jill, all I'm asking, will you make a choice? And will you follow me? Love is ownership. No one can claim ownership more than the Lord Jesus Christ because he made us in the beginning and then he went to the cross to buy us back so that we can belong to him again for all eternity. So sometimes when I pray and I say, God, why is it a no? Why are you saying no to something I so dearly want? He says, Jill, my daughter, I'm saying no because I love you so much. There is this certain thing in your life. You have made an idol. And I not only own you and created you in the beginning, I bought you back. I don't want anything between me and you. There's a circumstance, a situation, something in your life. I'm bringing you to a straight place. I'm bringing you to a narrow place and a hard place. Why? To show you what is in your heart so that you can give it to me. Psalm 37, verse 4, David says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I remember earnestly praying for something, agonizing with God. God, please, I want this. Please, why can't it be a yes? Please. And he said, Jill, delight in me. And I said, I am. He said, no, you're not. Don't you love it? God's so honest. Praise the Lord for that. He said, no, you're not. I said, why aren't you giving me the desire of my heart? And he said, the desire of your heart is not in harmony with my will. Surrender that desire. Delight in him. I will bring your desires into harmony with me. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul knows what it is like for God to say no. To say no because he loved him too much. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now we could debate what the thorn in the flesh is, but we won't get into that. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. It says, Paul speaking, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. So Paul prayed, what does it say? If you go on the next verse, three times, God, please take this. God, I don't want this. Please. Couldn't it be a yes? Now, the Bible doesn't say God said no. At least in this passage, it doesn't. But what does God say? My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, I don't know, when we get to heaven, we would truly understand God's purpose. So I, I can't begin to understand that. But at the same time, since Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure, that tells me that there was maybe, maybe a little pride going on in Paul's life. I don't know. But because he said that, you could kind of pick that up and maybe, just maybe, the reason God said no to removing that thorn, to removing that trial, was because God had ownership. And he said, Paul, I don't want anything in your life that would separate you from me. Love is protection. Love is ownership. Love is sacrifice for the salvation of someone else. Back in 1956, there was a group of missionaries who went from America to Ecuador. You probably know the story. And they went as missionaries to the tribesmen there in Ecuador. And five of the young men in that mission party were killed. Two of the most famous would be Jim Elliott and Nate Saint. But there were three other men that were killed. They were in their late 20s or early 30s. Now, if I had been involved in that situation... If I'd been the wife, if I'd been uh, maybe them before they were finally speared to death and thinking, God, but we came as missionaries, but we're on a mission for you, but we're seeking to serve you and we're doing everything. Why? 
And yet God said, no, I love you too much. How could that be love? How could you allow the death of my spouse? How is that even love? And what happened? Those women, the widows, they went back to the tribe. They not only forgave the people who had killed their husbands, they led them to Christ. God said no so that someone else could be saved. Sometimes the difficulties that we go through have nothing to do with us. Everything to do with the salvation of someone else. Nate, um, Nate's son, his name is Steve Saint, he said the distinction of the five men and the five women who are even more heroic than the men, and I, wouldn't you agree? I mean, I'm a woman, so ignore that. But anyways, it seems to me that the, the women were extremely heroic because they had all gone as missionaries, but the men were killed, and now the women are going back to the same people who killed their husband. That takes tremendous forgiveness and courage. He says, the distinction of the five men and the five women who are even more heroic than the men is simply that they cared about other people and were willing to give their lives so that someone else could live. That was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And what did he say? No, because the whole world then could be saved. That would be Esther. I don't know anyone who wants to go be a concubine for a king. Now, she became the queen, but she didn't know that when she went in, going into a harem. I don't know anyone who would want that. I'm sure she begged and pleaded, God, can I have a good Jewish husband? Why are you giving me this pagan? Why, why am I? And yet, God said, no, why? Because a whole nation was going to be saved. Now, I want to be clear. This is not saying that the evil and the suffering and the destruction that happens in the world is caused by God. We know the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. But in the midst of this world of sin, God can turn something around for good, for the salvation of someone else or even for our own selves. How do we handle the hurt? How do we handle the trial? How do we handle the pain? How do we handle when God says, no, Jill, and I'm saying no because I love you too much? What do we do with that? I think one of the best ways, this is just from my own personal experience, and there's many ways we could talk about. I just want to talk about one. That is to praise. Praise is not about God. It's about me. It doesn't change God. It changes me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In only the things I like. Only the things that make me happy. Only the things that, no. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I remember when Greg and I first got our diagnosis, this was 14 years ago maybe, that we couldn't have kids. And the doctor called on the phone, which is kind of peculiar. I don't know why they didn't do that in the office. But anyways, he called on the phone. Greg was at work. And I remember hanging up the phone and running out the front door. We live on a gravel road in the country. 3ABN is really, U.S. is really in the country. And running down the gravel road, and I was just crying, and I couldn't stop. Just thinking, God, it's everything I wanted and thought was going to happen and dreamed. And why are you saying no? And it was a sunny day. It was April. It was springtime. Birds were singing. But I couldn't feel the sun on my face, and I couldn't hear the birds, and I didn't know anything. All I knew is I hurt. And God, why? Did you allow this to happen to me? And I remember I got a ways down the road. And then it was like I felt God tap me on the shoulder. Now, not literally, okay, but you know you sense the presence of God. And he said, Jill, my precious daughter, count your blessings. And I thought, what's wrong with you, God? I mean, I'm going through a hard time. The least you could offer is some pity. The least you could give me is to put your arm around my shoulder and give me some comfort. 
Why am I supposed to praise when it hurts? And I didn't understand why, but I made a choice. Okay, God, I'm going to do it anyway. And so I said, God, I thank you because you're good, and I thank you because you are on the throne, and I thank you that you're love, even though right now it doesn't feel like you are, but I'm still choosing to thank you. And I thank you for my husband and for ministry and family. And you know what happened? As I praised, as I chose, made a mental choice in my mind to give thanks, God began to change my heart. And I could feel the sun and I could hear the birds. And it was like the presence of Jesus just wrapped me up in a blanket. That's what happens when we praise. It's not about God. It's about the change that he wants to do in our lives. What does praise do? First, praise takes the focus off of me and it turns it to God. Psalm 35, 28, my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. Now, have you ever noticed that you can't speak about two different things at the same time? Now, I can definitely think many thoughts at the same time, but I cannot speak many things at the same time. So if I'm speaking praise to God, what does that mean? That means then I cannot be nurturing my own pain focused on my own stuff. When I'm speaking praise to God, it takes the focus off of me and turns it outward and upward unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, praise makes the enemy flee. Remember Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, when the Moabites and the Ammonites came against him, that whole chapter is great in 2 Chronicles, but verse 22 says, Now when they began to sing and praise, what happened? The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Praise makes the enemy flee. Do you feel surrounded by Satan? Do you feel in your life like you're going through a hard time, you're going through a trial, and Satan is oppressing you? Praise makes the enemy flee. Number three, praise, especially united praise, invites the presence of Jesus. Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles, sorry. Turn with me to Second Chronicles. We're going to verse five. I love this scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 5, excuse me, not verse. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one. That, is that unity? When you come together as one? Okay. So when the trumpeters and singers were as one, so we have unity, to make one sound, there we have that unity again, one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord. So this is a praise session, a united praise session. So they're coming together as one. They're lifting up their voices in praise, saying... For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. What happened? What was the result? When they came together as one, and when they praised the Lord, what happened? That's right. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Now that is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now that's incredible because we're not talking about a light cloud that just kind of drifted into the tabernacle. We're not talking about just the little haze and you think, I think maybe I see a cloud. It was so thick that they could not even continue ministering. What does that mean? Praise invites God's presence. Do you need the presence of Jesus in your life? Choose to praise. Praise invites his presence. Number four, praise gives strength and joy. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
So remember the united praise when they came together as one and they praised what happened? The presence of God came. Now in this verse, we see that if we're in the presence of God, we have joy. So if we need joy, we need to praise because that will bring the presence of God. And then the presence of God brings joy. Next verse, Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So the joy leads to strength. I was never very good at math. I hated algebra and geometry and all of those theorems and, you know, those things. But I do remember one about, like, A, if A equals B and this equals C, then A equals C. Remember one of those equations? So if I praise unitedly and that brings the presence of God and then if I have the presence of God that gives me joy and if I have joy that gives me strength what does that mean if I'm weak if I'm tired if I'm discouraged if I'm having a hard time I gotta go back to the beginning and I need to praise praise gives us strength praise gives us joy praise invites the presence of Jesus Praise allows God to work. That's number five. Praise allows God to work. Remember Paul and Silas when they were in jail in Philippi? What does the Bible say? At midnight. Now, it could have been literally at midnight, but I think even emotionally, they felt like it was midnight. But they chose to praise and sing praises. They were praying and singing hymns to God. What happened? God showed up and delivered them. So praise takes the focus off myself and it turns it to God. Praise makes the enemy flee. Praise invites God's presence. Praise gives me strength and joy. Praise allows God to work in my life. Now, you might be saying, I'm just not real good at praise. I remember there was a gentleman, all of you from 3ABN US would know exactly who I'm talking about, who's always happy. And so if you say to him, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm praising the Lord. I'm doing good. And oh, God is good. And he's always giving praises and always excited and happy. And I remember he broke his hip a couple years ago. And Greg and I went to see him in the hospital. And we went to encourage him. And you know what happened? He encouraged us. So he had broken his hip and he's in pain and yet he's telling us how he's giving out literature to the nurses and how he's witnessing for Jesus and how he's... And I came away encouraged. And the next day, I was at work at 3ABN, and there's a lady who's on the other end of the spectrum, not on the praise end. She could be on the critical end. And so I, I said to her, how are you doing today? We'll call her Sarah. How are you doing today, Sarah? And she says, oh, it's one of those days. And I said, guess what, Sarah? I went to see this gentleman in the hospital last night. And I went to encourage him, and he had broken his hip, and he encouraged me. And she said, oh, some people are just like that. And you know what? That is true, but do you know why? It's a practice. It's a habit. You know, when I was a kid growing up, they always said practice makes perfect. I don't know if you teach that in Australia, practice makes perfect. Well, I don't believe that. Because if you practiced him, if you practice the wrong note on the piano and you always hit a B flat instead of a B, what happens? You have it perfectly wrong. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So that means we can make a choice to praise. That can become a permanent habit. Greg and I were at the zoo in Florida. And I like to look at the big cats, the lions and the tigers. and the, I love those animals. And it just reminds me in heaven we'll be able to sit down with them. And what a tremendous blessing. So the leopard, I don't I remember his name, but one of the types of leopards. He was in his cage, and it was a nice big cage, and he had all kinds of room in it. And yet, when Greg and I were there, 
he did this. He's walking up one side. He's right against the edge of the cave, cage. And then he turned around and he started on this end. Now, he had a whole other section over here, right? That he could have walked in. He had all kinds of stuff. And he walked right along the edge of the cave, cage. Now, there was nice grass and everything was lush. But the grass was gone here. And guess what? It was dirt. And not only was it dirt, it was a rut. A rut had formed where he walked. So you know what? As Christians, we, I, can fall into a rut. And I start walking. Woe is me. I can't believe all the problems I'm having in life. Boom. Turn around. Oh, I wish someone would give me some more affirmation. And I'm having such a hard time. Turn around. Oh, Father, I don't know. Why aren't you smiling on me and I can't feel your presence? Turn around. But what if I made a choice and I said, God, I'm stepping out, right? I'm stepping out. God, I'm tired of living in the rut. God, I'm tired of life with pain and life with fear. I'm tired of life with jealousy. I'm tired of life as I'm living it. I'm tired of questions. God, I want to step out. I make a choice. Thank you that you're my father. Now I'm half in and half out, right? Half on the grass, half in the rut. God, I thank you that you've re redeemed me. Woo! God, I thank you that I am your daughter. Another step. God, I thank you for the privilege of reading your word. Another step. God, I thank you that every experience in life you can turn, Romans 8, 28, for good to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. And you know what happens? Step by step, promise by promise, we walk from the devil's pit, from the devil's rut, right out into the arms of Jesus. There's the last two we haven't gotten to. God says, no, not yet. What do we do in the midst of the waiting time? Then he says, no, I love you too much. I love you and I want to protect you. I love you and I want to own you and buy you back and redeem you. I love you. You are mine. I love you. Even this trial can work for someone else's salvation. We can make a choice to praise. What about yes? I thought you'd never ask. James 4, 2. You have not because you asked not. Psalm 2, 8. Ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. What are we to ask for? Ask for the conversion of your family, your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, the world. Ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ask for revival and reformation to spring forth in your life. Ask for a new heart, a heart of flesh. Ask for God to write his law in your heart and in your mind. Ask to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Ask that he could be glorified in your life, in the midst of your trials. Ask for spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Ask to have his name written on your forehead. Ask to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Ask to be transformed into his image. Ask for grace to endure and strength to overcome. Ask for victory from sin. Ask for deliverance from bondage. Ask for freedom in Christ. Ask for peace that passes all understanding and what do we do we thank him thank him that all his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus what about the last category yes and so much more higher than we can think or even imagine is God's ideal for you and I 
as his children. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think, according to the power of God that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So how do we know God through trials? What if we're in this stage over here and we're praying and asking and waiting desperately for an answer? And God's saying, no, not yet. What if we're here? And I know some of you here today are in this place right now. Everything you wanted or asked for or dreamed about seems like it's just crashing around you and it's being shattered. And God says, no, I love you too much. What if you're over here and God says, yes, I thought you would never ask. Or what if we're all the way over here? And he says, yes, and so much more. No matter where we are today, God invites us to know him. He invites us to experience him as we never have before. It all comes down to trust. Do I trust him with my life? Do I love him enough to trust his leading? no matter what happens. Do I love him? Do I even really know him? This is eternal life, that they may know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are love. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that you created us and formed us from the dust of the ground in the beginning. And that you redeemed us at the cross. And that you want to recreate in us the image of Jesus. Father, just now I give my life to you anew. And my brothers and sisters here do as well. We ask that you would do a new thing in our hearts and lives, and that we could know and trust you, even in the midst of the trial. And we thank you in Jesus' name.